uh, praising our God, praising our God. One of my favorite things to do. So we're going to get started. What is praising God? What's true praise? What's not? How to pray? We're just going to have a sort of a roundabout, uh, a, a round of different teachings rather on the subject of praise and worship. Praise the Lord. So uh, do you know that there is power in your praise? Amen. That there is power in your praise. Well, the devil knows it. And that's why he tries to keep you from praising God. It's why he tries to keep you bound and tied up and and so busy until you just don't have time to give God adequate praise. So um, we need to know it too. Okay. So praise is a part of us. Praise is inherent in each and every one of us. It is something we were created to do. God created, created us to praise him. That was one of the main things that he wanted us to do. Life is full of praise. Parents praise their kids and grandparents praise them more. Uh, teachers praise their students. Spouses praise each other. So praise is something we were born with deep in our spirit, man. It is an integral part of life. We praise what we value. We praise what we support. We praise what we love. Amen? Amen. So praise is what we do. Praise should be part of us. Praise should be uh, as much of uh, a part of us as eating and sleeping and doing everything else that we do. That should be incorporated in our life. Praising God. But what about our praises to God? That's the most important. I pray not out of religious duty or obligation. I pray because I want to hear my father's heart and I want him to hear mine. Most would agree that he is what we love and value the most, right? Yes. So we, we say that but we don't see a lot of praise going forward the way that it should. So why is it so difficult for so many of us to praise him? Okay, it's a good question, right? Why is it so difficult for us to praise him? So in our study tonight, let's focus on what praise to God is and what it's not. Let's learn how to give honorable praise to the one who gives us so much. Amen. That is so true. Okay. Praise is inner health made audible. Praise is inner within us. Our inner health made audible. For those with a healthy spiritual life, praise is natural. It comes natural. It easily flows from the heart of a believer who has a strong relationship with God. It just comes out. Oh, God, I praise you. I praise you for this, God. Something happens and uh, you just want to shout it out no matter where you are. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, because when we ultimately know where everything comes from, and that's God in our life. We want to give him the praise, the honor, and the glory. Amen? Amen. Now, for others, religious training, lack of understanding, fear of embarrassment, and pride inhabit the spirit man from thriving in health, causing praise to be silenced. So for most of us, like I said, it comes natural. But for others, you know, a lack of training, under, you know, just I don't know what praise is or I get embarrassed when I praise God in unknown uh, circles. You know, a lot of people are OK when they're around other Christians, but you don't see too many people praising God 
away from the church setting. Amen. You just don't. And um, I, I, I'm thinking that most of it is uh, embarrassment or, you know, uh, what would people think? Everybody is always thinking about what other people think. Let's think about what God thinks. He's the one that we should be trying to please, right? As, as we go forward in our study, I want you to think about how you view God. I believe the lack of viewing God as our sovereign creator plays a major part in our hold back in true, honest praise. While we hold back and not just let go and let God, amen? I believe just the way we see God, the way we um, love him, the way that we want him in our life, everything about him, uh, just knowing what he has done for us so far, beginning with creating a beautiful world for us to be in and allowed us to be here. And every day when we wake up, he's allowed us to be here another day. He's allowed that. That's enough to give praise right there, right? So the more we know about God and what he's done and what he it continues to do and what he is about to do, I'm hoping that that'll play a big part in helping you to grow in your worshiping, worshiping of our creator God. Any questions or comments? Okay. All right. So let's look at, uh, let's break it down a little bit. Number one, praise gives us access to God. Psalms 100, uh, 100 and verse four says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and in his courts would praise and his courts would praise. So this verse refers to Moses's tabernacle in the wilderness. The tabernacle was divided into three parts. It had the outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies where God dwelled. There was only one gate and one entrance into the outer court. If you wanted to approach God, you had to go through the gate into the courtyard and finally into the Holy of Holies. That's a picture. I found a couple of pictures to give you an idea what the tabernacle in the wilderness looked like when they were in the wilderness going to the promised land. And they would, um, on the, on the right-hand side, that's a, a better view of what it probably looked like. And uh, remember, uh, we talked about how they would break camp when the, the glory cloud would uh, move. That means they moved. When the glory cloud settled, they settled and they would make camp. And that's what camp. Look around at the top of the picture. All of those are uh, tents and places where they slept. And, uh, you know, as they waited to move to the next place. They would uh, make camp around the um, the tabernacle. And so that's a pretty good artist rendition of what it looked like. So in the days of Moses, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. It was not accessible to everyone. However, when our high priest died, talking about Jesus, uh, according to uh, Hebrews 4, 14 through 17, the veil to the Holy of Holies was torn. It was made, it ripped down the middle, allowing us access to God. Hallelujah. So at one time, only the high priest was allowed. Now we are all allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. If you are born again, a child of God, you are allowed access directly to God. Okay. We're going to read Hebrews. Okay. Four. Hebrews uh, 4, 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, 
Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Okay, let us come boldly before oh. the, um, you know, uh, sometimes we come boldly because we need to confess our sins and we need to get back right with God if we have missed the mark. So whatever the case, uh, if things are going good, we need to come boldly and praise him and thank him for leading and guiding and, and for you hearing, for us hearing, because it's all about hearing his direction and um, heeding his direction and his rules and, and uh, his laws. And when we do that, we can come even more boldly because we, are, uh, we please God and he's pleased with us. But sometimes we need to come boldly to get close to him, to ask for forgiveness. Whatever the case, we can come boldly to the throne of God directly. We don't have to wait for the high priest once a year to um, go into the Holy of Holies and make atonement for our sins. We can go any day, 24-7. Amen? Amen. Okay. So the gate you come through to approach God is Thanksgiving. And the court you enter is praise. Psalm 104, 100 and verse 4 should be so much more meaningful in light of its historical context. In church, praise and worship is not the opening act to the pastor's message. Praise softens the soil of your heart so the seeds of the message can be planted. To have direct access to God, it is essential to come through praise, have an attitude of praise. Before you read your uh, devotional, and your prayer time, your special time with God, approach it with praise, approach it with a good attitude, with a good heart, with a listening heart. Amen? Amen. So praise is an attitude of the heart. You can surely tell where someone stands with Christ by the praise coming from their hearts. God even gave us our special prayer and praise language. In 1 Corinthians 12, it speaks of the gift of, of the Holy Spirit with nine manifestations of this gift. The prayer and praise gift is the gift of speaking in unknown languages or what we call tongues. And we're going to read that to recap. 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away for those dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God called Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gift, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the same spirit. 
to another discerning of spirits, to an, another different kinds of tongues. That's what he was talking about. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Amen. So just, uh, we know this, you know, we've uh, uh, had lessons on the gifts of the spirit, but it's always good to just go over them, especially when we're talking about something like praise and worship, to understand that God has, um, besides your regular language, daily language and language of the land that you live in, uh, which to us is English, he has given us a special language. Uh, we call it an unknown language or tongues. Uh, and this is our prayer language that we can use. It's a perfect language. When we pray in our spiritual language, it is a perfect language. We don't understand what we're saying, but it's coming from the Holy Spirit. And it touches the heart of God because we're not putting our little bit in there or uh, adding to it when we let the Holy Spirit flow through us, through our language, we are praying and praising God in a perfect language. So if you do not have the uh, gift of the Spirit and especially the uh, the audible uh, gifts, which is the speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues that we use in the church, um, ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Just as simple as that, to fill Amen. you with the Holy Spirit and yield to the Holy Spirit and he will do it. That's all any of us have done. Amen. 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 And then you got to make it personal. How can you incorporate praise into your everyday life, giving you access to God? You can praise him before your prayer or Bible study time. You can turn on praise music while you're doing your chores and sing to him before you pray. You can praise him before you open your Bible. You can turn on praise music as you are driving to work or to church. And if you have your prayer language, it's a lot easier and you can do it longer. Everybody you talk to uh, can pray longer with their prayer language than they can in their natural language. You can go for hours. You can like sing praises to God for hours in your prayer language. You look around, you think only a few minutes has, have gone by and it's been a half an hour or an hour. Okay. Got to till up the soil of your heart with praise and then allow God to plant his words into fresh soil. Okay. So our praise should be directed to God. Praise God for who he is. Pastor Sam, can I get you to read this slide? Uh, 51. Uh, uh, no, start with the source. At the top. It should be directed to God. Okay. The source of praise and the Holy Spirit activate your spirit, soul, to express approval and adoration of God's greatness. Psalms 51, 15. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare thy praise. Psalms 119 to 164. Seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous judgment. As you begin to praise the Lord, your spirit and your soul will rise up to a higher level of exuberance and joy. <laughs> yeah. Exuberance. <laughs> Say that word for me. Exuberance. Exuberance. Okay. You will become enlightened with the revelation of who he is. You will then find faith raising up within and declaring there's nothing too hard for you. And that's found in Jeremiah 32, 17. And Don't you like that, uh, 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 the uh, verse, Psalm 119, 164, it says, seven times a day I praise you mm -hmm. because of your righteous judgments. 
I mean, when I see uh, like the scripture that says, how many times should we forgive each other? 70 times seven. That means um, there's no limit. And so I kind of get the same uh, connotation from this seven times a day. It's like all day long, I'm praising God all day long. It, it might not be audible just in my spirit. I'm praising God. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for leading me to this, this turkey that was on sale. I mean, <laughs> thank him in everything. Thank him in everything. Because you could have went to another store and not find the, the turkey at that price or whatever it is. So um, what I'm saying is that we praise him even in the small things. Because he's the one that led you there. He's the one that opened the door. He's the one that shed the light on a different or uh, a certain subject or an answer that you were looking for you might be reading your bible and open it to the to the it just falls open and you just say hmm what is this let me just read it and like i just did right before we started and uh, i was in uh, uh jeremiah chapter 23 and i just just opened my bible you know i hadn't turned to any scripture yet and god gave me a word in it so try that sometimes just when you open it before you turn to the to the uh scripture that you intended to turn to just see what it opened to you know and uh there's a blessing on every page anyway so whatever you turn to or whatever it opens to you're going to get blessed amen so just be ready and you praise him for that thank you lord for leading me to that verse Thank and, uh, thank and praise him for what he has done and what he will continue to do. Thanksgiving and uh, uh, Thanksgiving awakens your love towards God as you acknowledge that you are his child. Thank and praise him that he gives every good and perfect gift to you. Everything that he does is good and it's perfect because he's good and he's perfect. Amen. Amen. So you respond with joy to him for his benefits and his ways. Um, Proverbs 3, 6 says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. What do you think that means, somebody? In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you when you read that? For me, it means um, everything that I can do, um, I, so acknowledge means consult, I think. Mm -hmm. So you ask for guidance on certain things. Man. And then when um, like you are just doing your everyday normal things, um, you're just always thankful. And grateful for um, mm -hmm. the Lord being with you. And then if you are in that attitude, then things are, um, will become not easier. I don't want to say easy, but I, if you take the time to acknowledge God, I think he does, he'll direct you. <laughs> Amen. Or, um, you're allowing him to take control by acknowledging him that he is in charge and he is in control and he is sovereign and he is going to uh, give you the best and direct you in the right path. The only thing mm -hmm. we, gotta, we gotta listen, right? Yeah. He's always directing us but we get in trouble when we don't acknowledge him and we don't listen mm -hmm. and we choose to do the opposite of what he directs us to do. Mm -hmm. But he's always directing us. And uh, so that, yeah, that's a, that's a good. Uh, I guess the key word also, the key word would say in all, say what part of your life do you not let mm -hmm. God be in control of? Was well, it mm -hmm. in A-L-L, -L, all. In everything that you do, 
what about this uh, second verse here, Psalm 116, 12, and then verse 17. It says, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Yes. So what shall I render to, you know, um, when you think about it, what can we give God? He has it all. Yes. But what do you think he wants from us? He wants pray. He wants us to pray. He wants all of us. He don't want yep, to pray. Yeah. Yes. So it says, what can I give God? What can I give him for all of these things that he gives me every day? What I mean, what little old little old me? What can I render to God for all of his benefits? But we render praise and worship. Yeah. Yep. In our all, yes. And everything that we do, we worship and praise him for. Yep. So that means that we cannot do things ungodly because we cannot bring it to God. So that's us all in that, you know. And there's good, and there's less chance of us doing anything wrong yes. when we are walking in his ways and we when we acknowledge him before we do anything. Mm -hmm. Um if he is number one in our sights when we begin our day or activities or whatever, in all of our ways, acknowledge him. In all of the things that we do, acknowledge him and he will make our path straight. He'll send us in the right direction. He'll put us on the right path. Mm -hmm. He'll put us in the company of good people. He will open doors. Mm -hmm. So we keep him first. Basically, we keep him first and we give him praise and worship. When you put those two verses together, they kind of make sense going together. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. I will give you seven Hebrew words mm -hmm. for praise, seven Hebrew words for praise. And, you know, when you get a hold of these, you know, uh, and look, I want you to get a piece of paper because I didn't print out all of these, um, um, verses for you but uh the verses in you know for each one represents the type of uh praise that is spoken of okay so um the first one is tada mm. uh that means sacrifice of thanksgiving of praise it means to render thanksgiving and praise or praise and that's found in psalm 42 verse four, and also our verse 100, verse four, Psalm verse uh, 100, chapter 100, verse four. And then the second Hebrew word is yada. And that means to throw, to thrust, or cast away from hands outward, or to throw your hands into the air, to yada. So, Lord, I want to yada you. And um, so that's Psalm 67, 107, 8, and then verse 15, 21, and 31. When you see praise in those were in that those uh verses, it means yada. That's what they're doing. So when you look it up, you'll see it. Uh the The third one is Barash, to bless, mm -hmm. to give thanks and praise to God because he has given out of his abundance to bless as an act of adoration or to kneel. Mm -hmm. 21, 63, 4, 95, 6. Um, the next one is Halal. To make a show or boast. Gene or wave raving way to dance, to celebrate, to have a good time, Amen. to halal. Yeah. When you see the the uh that's one thing about the Jewish people, when you see them, they know how to praise God. They're all over the place, they're dancing, they're falling around, they're just throwing up their hands and just loving on God. They don't care who's looking. 
where we in America, sometimes we're so, you know, who's looking at me, putting my hands up in the air. What are they going to, what are they going to think? We better start thinking about what God is going to think. So halal comes from <clears throat> uh, Psalm 56, 4 and 150, 1 and 2. Then you have Zamar to celebrate with instruments, to praise the Lord skillfully on an instrument, to touch strings with the fingers. So that is strumming uh, the guitar or violin or something like that, I guess. Psalm 21, 13, 33, 2, and 98, 4. Uh, the next one is Tehillia, Tehillia, interpret summons to praise Jehovah. Interpretive, I'm sorry, summons to praise Jehovah God. A psalm or a hymn by choirs with dancing and expressive speaking, festive it should be festive jubilation. Psalm 22, 3, 25, uh, Psalm 33, 1, and then 35, 28. And then the next one is Shabbat. To praise, to comment, to sue, to steal, adoration towards the power, glory, and sanctity of the Lord. To praise God and deeds, to triumph in a loud voice. See, we don't praise God in a loud voice, do we? We don't use all of our lung capacity when we praise God, and we should. And it's okay. It's okay to talk loud when we're praising our God. Run the devil away. <laughs> and that comes from Son. We have, 7, 12. we have a little unstable okay. connection tonight. Okay. Is is everybody not hearing me? You cut out every now and then. It popped up on the screen, unstable connection a little bit. You're okay, though. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me move my mic a little closer, maybe. Okay. All right. Any question on those? Aren't those fabulous? Mm -hmm. You know, just know that they're... You cut out again. Now here are some examples of bodily expression through praise. Well, do that. Do that one over. You cut out. For a I'm sorry. You had cut out. Um. Uh, do what over? I'm sorry. Okay, the, the, your last... Uh, Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you now. Okay. Uh, you do some is, anyone else, is anyone else having a problem hearing me? You're going in and out. Yes. What else to do besides mm -hmm. I'm going to put my mic mm -hmm. as close as I could? I, don't, I, I think it's just the internet service. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, can uh, uh, okay, this is examples of bodily expression through praise. When you clap your hands and stomp your feet, you portray your excitement. <laughs> so it's okay to clap your hands and stomp your feet. According to those verses there, I'm not going to read them all. But you can write them down or you can get them off of the uh, uh, the video. The next one, when you stand up, march, or walk, you portray readiness to serve or to go. When you lift your hands, you are worshiping and surrendering to God. When you dance, you express great joy. All of these are found in the Bible, just ways to express our joy 
and with our bodily expression. And when we when you sing, you express gladness of heart. Look at all of those verses about singing. You might say, I can't sing. God thinks you can. When you Play skillfully on an instrument, you show forth adoration. When you fall prostrate, prostrate, that means falling down flat in homage to royalty or to God, you portray deep emotion and total surrender to God. When you kneel, you are portraying humility and dependence upon God. And when you sit down or keep silent, you show forth rest and trust in God. And all of those scriptures represent what I just read. Any question on any one of those? Does anybody want to share what their best position to praise God and and call out to God? How do you how do you uh, how do you Praise God. What's your best way to praise God? Anyone? Well, I like to praise God when I'm alone and in my prayer room, as you know, and also when I'm uh, getting on my knees and praise God. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, try some of these other ways. Mm -hmm. You know, just, you know, since the Bible speaks of them, Mm -hmm. um god wants or i believe he intended for us to use them mm -hmm. um other ways of using your body using your voice and uh, uh to praise god and to show love and to uh, worship him okay now praise changes you when you praise God, it changes you. I pray not out of religious duty or obligation. I pray because I want to hear my father's heart and I want him to hear mine. Praise can change you if you allow it. Praise changes relationships. It changes hearts. It changes mindsets. In praise, our focus shifts from us to the Lord. Or it should, right? When we are in, I call it deep praise. That means that when you start praising God and start calling out to him and reading a verse or whatever, it's, to me, it's, it's to the way I explain it or in, in myself, I'm doing it in my own um capacity but the more i do it as time goes on when i'm talking to god and when i'm reading when i begin to praise god the holy spirit takes over the holy spirit takes over and i'm not going to say it's no longer me but it's more of the holy spirit than it is me and, you know, when you are praising God, when you're talking to God, when you're just speaking in, in the spirit, it just embraces you. Spirit just embraces you. And you go into your prayer language or you go into your study, whatever you're doing. But the longer you do it and the more you yield to the Holy Spirit, he takes over. And it's a beautiful thing. And if you haven't tried it, I would surely encourage you to try it. To say, Holy Spirit, just take over as I begin to praise you tonight. Take over, Lord, as I begin to worship you, as I begin to sing in the spirit, as I begin to uh, read my scriptures tonight, Lord God, just take over, Father God. Illuminate the word of God before me so that they become, those words become real to me in a, in a special way. 
Show me what I need, Lord God, for this situation or this situation in my life. And that's how you approach God. That's how you enter in. And you enter in, when you enter in to the Holy of Holies, into your prayer time, like I said, when you start, you just start like you're doing any other chore and thing. You know, I got to I got to uh, spend my time with God. I'm getting ready to read. I'm getting ready to uh, prepare my lesson. I'm getting ready to worship God. And you open that door and you say, God, I want to walk into your presence with thanksgiving and praise this morning. And I want you to enhance my praise to you. Because it's about you, God. I'm just tuning everything else out right now. And I want it to be just you and me. Just you and me. And begin to worship him. Begin to go into your prayer language. Begin to just call out to him. Just call out to him. Man, you'll see things begin to happen. You'll see the heavenlies begin to open. Whew. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So in praise, our focus shifts from us to the Lord, mm -hmm. from problems to the solution, from pain to promise, and from hurt to hope. Right? Can you imagine a family committed to prayer and praise? How awesome that household could be. Okay, we're talking about an individual, but just say the whole family just sets time you know every day hopefully but if not yeah you know, i know how busy life is just say on monday wednesday and friday or monday and thursday or monday whatever time it is the family knows to meet together and pray and praise and have a time of devotion together and begin it with worship entering in to his presence the devil has no chance there in that household. He cannot tolerate the praises of God's people. That's why he tries to stop it. Nobody said he wasn't clever, right? That's the same that you take that one. Okay, Proverbs uh, 27, 21 says, and the fighting... And the fire that should be refining pot for silver and the furnace for gold is a man to his praise. You get refined, redone all over again. So often when we have heated our spirits in worship, thoughts, desires, and attitudes rise to the surface. As we are broken and heated in the presence of the Lord, these negative attitudes rise to the surface of our heart. We are then to be able to bring them to Jesus to be forgiven and cleansed amen yeah. and uh yeah that uh word in proverbs as a refining pot refining, yeah, so. mm -hmm. okay and um which okay which, yeah. uh, makes us think about uh, uh silver being refined have you ever visited a silversmith shop or even saw a let's say a youtube documentary on making of silver. This is kind of what happens to us. You got to push this down or the crucible will tip over and spill out all your silver. Silversmithing was a respected profession. Uh, many silversmiths were trusted, sort of like bankers. Jewelry would have been probably the top thing that silversmiths would make, followed by spoons. When we make spoons in the shop today, you start by casting an ingot of silver, and then that ingot of silver is hammered out through a series of stages to slowly become the spoon blank. And then once the spoon blank is made, it is struck into a, a tin die with a steel punch to form the bowl. It's bent straight, filed up, and polished. When we're melting and pouring silver, 
it absorbs a lot of oxygen. And in its liquid state, it will hold up to 20 times its own volume in oxygen. If we don't do something to try to prevent the oxygen from being absorbed, or if we don't do something to remove the oxygen once it has been absorbed, you can see the oxygen burning off. When we pour the silver into a mold to produce something, the ingot will, as it cools, you'll end up with little air holes in the ingot itself. And this is a bad thing because when you hammer it into sheet, it's more flaky and you want a solid piece of metal when you're hammering it. Now this is a good ingot, as is evidenced by the fact that there are no cracks from where it cooled it irregularly and there are no pits in it. Now all these little pieces of silver that we spilled, we will save and melt again later. In the 18th century, an ounce of silver was on average worth about three days pay for a young working tradesman. So it was very much more expensive than it is today. So silversmiths would recycle the rags that they used when polishing. They would recycle all their filings, recycle all the scrap that they cut away, melting that down. Now this hammer is called a forging hammer or a cross bean hammer. And this is the hammer that I use prime. Uh, this face of the hammer uh, works like a wedge, so it moves through the metal in two directions. And then this face of the hammer spreads the metal out in all directions and helps, of course, to take out the sharp hammer marks made by this hammer. Customers would recycle their silver. Customers would bring their old silverware to silversmiths, be melted down and made into new things. Sort of an affectation of the rich. The rich had silver in part as a way to uh, store some of their excess wealth. So if you had a spoon made of silver, you had a spoon made of money. Uh, when push came to shove, you needed to liquidate some of your assets. This was one of the easiest things to liquidate. This is a little flux. This protects the silver. Discoloration. When you've hammered silver for a while, it becomes work-hardened and brittle. So you must anneal it, which means to heat it up to about 1100 degrees Fahrenheit, and then remove it from the fire and quench it immediately in a solution of acid and water. Acid and water cools it very quickly and cleans it at the same time. It really takes a very short period of time to anneal it. Because it's the best conductor of heat, it'll heat up very quickly and it also cools off very quickly pieces then soft again and ready to be hammered further. The grate on the floor is to uh, catch any filings of silver that are generated as we work. You get to save all the silver that falls to the floor and you wait until there's enough of it on the floor to make it worth picking it up. Planishing hammers are designed to do nothing more than take out all the hammer marks made by other hammers. So they have nice, smooth, highly polished faces, which are used to uh, blend and remove hammer marks made by other hammers. We're using about four different polishes. The first polish we usually use is called water of air stone. It's a very, very fine abrasive. If things have little irregularities in their surface, this will level them out. Thomas takes out scratches made by the water of air stone, uh, and it also will take out file marks and fine hammer marks. But it leaves scratches that are still visible to the naked eye. So these must then be removed with rotten stone. Rotten stone is a very fine abrasive that begins to leave fairly visible scratches. It takes out the pumice scratches, leaving scratches that are still just visible. But you do begin to get to see a shine on the metal when you're using rotten stone. And then the final abrasive that we use is jeweler's rouge. So jeweler's rouge uh, takes out the scratches made by the rotten stone and jeweler's rouge scratches are there, they're just invisible to the naked eye. So when you're done, your product ends up out as bright as that. All righty. <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about that for just a second. Um, Okay, just 
assuming and using the silversmith and what he's doing as an example of our life and and um, our life with God, uh, what are some of the steps that he used? What are some of the things that he did to that silver? They melted silver objects like uh, coins, uh, pictures, whatever to make the coins with. Okay. And I, and you know, I was thinking about you, Pat, when I was looking. You love hobbies and you love uh, uh, creativity. And uh, that sounds like something I, I could see Pat being a silversmith. <laughs> <laughs> He likes to tinker around and, you know, making <laughs> stuff and making stuff pretty. But uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Anything else? He molds us. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of work. Well, the, the heat was the most important part there, the refining fire, put it to getting, okay. all the, getting all the bad stuff out, separating it. No, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And and who else was that? I couldn't. It was that uh, Pulley or Eric or who was that? Uh, this is Benita. Benita. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot of work. So the way I put it, if I compare his work to us and God, it's a lot of work when you serve in God. I guess it is different steps that you go through. Mm-hmm. But it's a lot of work. So that means a lot of praying, a lot of studying, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Of. Mm -hmm. Before you get that perfection, right? Right, right. And that's what I'm getting to. That's exactly what I'm getting to. Um, that, that silver was, he beat it, he heated it, he drowned it, he put water. Yeah, that's a lot of work. <laughs> he, he hammered it again. Yep. Until he had perfection. Yep. And he didn't waste anything. And they, you got to be patient to do a job like that. Absolutely. I mean, I'm throw that spoon aside and say, <laughs> I'm going to go and buy one. <laughs> exactly. So patience, patience. Yep. Patience. Yep. Now, yeah. it's one thing about silver <laughs> what is, uh, that's very, very important. What do you have to keep doing with silver? Polishing. You have to keep polishing silver. Polishing it. If you don't polish silver, then it'll turn uh, real, you know, uh, grayish black and all that. You know, yeah. that's why a lot of people don't like to deal with silver silverware. You know, spoons and forks because yeah, you have to keep polishing it in the same right? way. Yeah, and they, they go what? to uh, stainless steel. Like it tarnish if you don't if you if like like Pastor said if you don't keep shining it up mm -hmm. it'll it, it'll 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 tarnish and turn a different color. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's a lot in that, and it's a lot we can kind of see in our life as Christians what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the other thing, it, we can see ourselves, uh, the steps that we ha uh, have to do to stay polished up and shiny and, and right before God. But if we look at God being the silversmith and how he molds and shapes us and uh, prepares us and the steps that uh, he so patiently uh, uses to bring us to the place where he wants us to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, God is our silversmith in hey, well. preparation of us as well. So I thought that was a pretty good analogy. And I said, well, let me just show this little video. Besides, it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me move on here. Okay. <laughs> All right, so you can't help but notice the silver before and after the fire touches. Before it hits the fire, the silver is rugged. It's hard. It's jagged. Once the fire begins the work of melting away the jagged pieces, the silver becomes pliable and smooth. You can almost see yourself in the melted silver. The silver becomes like a mirror. Only then is it able to be molded. Okay. In the fires of praise, God reaches out 
and melts down our jagged ed edges until we become smooth and pliable in his hands. Only then can we be molded into his image. We become so smooth and clear that when others look at us, when we look at ourselves, we see a mirror reflecting the image of Jesus. Amen. Okay. So something else, praise is a relationship, not a ritual. Okay. Uh, Psalm 8110 says, I am the Lord, your God. I am the Lord, your God. Isn't it wonderful to know that he is ours and we are his? Praise brings us into a, co a closer relationship with Jesus. I love Exodus 25, 8. God tells Moses to build a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. He didn't want a cathedral shining with jewels to show his awesomeness. He didn't ask for massive monuments or statues made of gold. God asked for a simple tent. It wasn't about a structure. It was about a relationship. He wanted a tabernacle just so he could be with us. That brings such tears to my eyes. Now think about God just wants a simple relationship with us. The God of all the earth could be anywhere, could have anything, could do anything. And yet he chooses to be with you or to be with me. I've been in the most beautiful structured churches, especially when we were in Israel. They're gorgeous to look at. But the spirit of the Lord is nowhere to be found in most of them. I've sat in simple living rooms with a handful of saints and the presence of God is so strong, it is tangible. You could almost feel it. So it's not about the place. It's about the heart. It's about the relationship. God doesn't want anything to dwell in but us. He wants relationship with us. That relationship comes through our praise. The problem comes when ritual, <clears throat> excuse me, ritual takes place of pure praise. A.W. Tozer. He was an evangelical pastor. He said, worship is no longer worship when it reflects the culture around us more than the Christ within us. That's a really was a powerful statement when he made that a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Now it's really reflecting the culture. Worship is what we call praise and worship. Mm -hmm. Now, on one hand, you have modern praise and worship movements at a quick glance. It looks more like a rock concert than a mm -hmm. worship service. We praise the singers of the songs more than the one we are singing about. Mm -hmm. We have lasers and fog machines and video displays have taken the place of a humble altar. That is the culture that we're in. And even, hum I'm sorry. That is the culture that we're in, right? Laser, fog machines, and video displays have taken the place of a humble altar and even humbler hearts. Mm -hmm. When churches altered their worship service to fit in with the culture of the day, it ceases to become worship. When our praise and worship becomes ritualistic in how it is displayed, it becomes less and less about relationship with the father can god move in the laser fog machines and electric guitars of course he could if he wanted to can god move in the rituals of worship of course he can do whatever he wants to he's god i'm not arguing how you should praise i am stating that if your cultural rituals replace relationship it's no longer becomes, it no longer becomes praise. True praise doesn't come from modern culture or a rigid religious system. True praise comes from relationship. Keep saying that. 
with Jesus. He inhabits the praises of his people. According to Psalm 22, 3, he dwells in, he lives in and abides in our praise. He just wants a relationship with you. Any questions, comments? Okay. Make it personal. Any relationship needs communication. Our relationship with Christ needs communication. Talk to him. Don't utter, utter a laundry list of I need and I want. Instead, like you would your spouse or your children or your best friend, tell him through the, your praise how wonderful he is. Tell him that you thank him for saving you. Tell him, tell the Lord that he's worthy. Then give him a chance to talk back to you. Pastor Sam, you want to read this one for me? Yes. Mm -hmm. The first mention of praise in the Bible is at the birth of Jacob's son, Judah, in Genesis 29, 35. Judah means praise. Hallelujah. No matter where you see the name Judah in the Bible, it always means praise. Revelation 5, 5 tells us that our Lord Jesus, the Lion of the tribe of the praise of Judah, has overcome. So many of us walk around in the fear of the enemy, whether it is the devil you fear or your own thoughts or your next door neighbor, we often walk around fearing our enemy and what he or she can do to us. Go ahead. In the historical book of the Bible, Judah is always performing. He is always moving. In Judges 1, 1 and 2, we read, now, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. I have delivered the land into his hand. God told uh, praise to go in first to the enemy. Praise in it the battle first. As the old saying goes, send Judah first in all ways. Thanks. Amen. Amen. Uh, by, the, by the way, uh, the um, Hamas, the enemy that um, uh, Israel is fighting now, mm -hmm. uh, are the descendants of Canaan, uh, the Canaanites. Mm -hmm. Just a little tidbit there. Amen. Okay, in 2 Chronicles uh, 20, verse 1, uh, King Jehoshaphat appointed singers to the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. So the choir and the orchestra went ahead of the warriors. Mm -hmm. It worked. The enemies were defeated, and Judah never even had to take Get out, out his the sword. Amen. How many battles do we needlessly fight? Well, Drawing our swords of worry, our shields of fear instead of faith, mm -hmm. and our words of war. What would happen? If we simply trusted that the lion of the tribe of Judah, Judah has already won the battle. Praise God. Amen. And also we'd like to say, let me add this one thing right quick before you go to the next one. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 15, it says, I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind. I will also sing Praise with my spirit, but I would also sing with my mind, meaning you, you could sing in the spirit also, like you speak in tongue or pray in tongues in the spirit. You can also sing in the spirit. Uh, yeah. Now, a lot of churches are kind of, uh, even Pentecostal churches are kind of getting away or not putting a lot of emphasis on the gifts of the spirit that's found in uh, 1 Corinthians 12 through 1 Corinthians 14. 
but you can ask the Holy Spirit to give you the gift to sing in the Spirit. And you can even sing songs that you don't even know the words. You can sing along with them in the Spirit, and it would bless the Lord also in that sense. Ask him for all the gifts that you need to worship okay. and praise God in the Spirit. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what would happen in our lives if we put away our warring words and lifted our voices in praise? It's been said, saints who would learn to do battle for the Lord should first learn how to praise. For God sends praise as the shock troops to drive the enemy back before the rest of the army is allowed to join the battle. So praise goes before the battle. Mm -hmm. Praise is a weapon. Uh, it's not only a communication with God, but it's also a weapon against the enemy. And that's why he tries to keep you from doing it. Yes. Like I mentioned at the beginning, because he knows how powerful real praise is. Mm -hmm. And he can't stand it. He closes up his ears, you know, like a, a little kid. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. When you begin to sing praises to God and speak the name of Jesus, even just the name of Jesus, he can't stand that name. That's why they try to take it out of school. That's why they take it out of the, our community. They try to take all evidence of our God out of our society because we live in a godless society now. So when we mention the enemy to them, the enemy, God or Jesus, it gets them all in a tizzy. So we want to do it even more, right? Yes. <laughs> we want to do it even more. You talk about your God. You speak about him wherever you go. Don't have any fear. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be, that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. You're falling into his trap. You know, when he brings fear uh, on you for uh, doing what should be natural to you as a Christian. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And you need to make it personal. Dear friends, what are you battling today? Is it fear? What about an unsaved husband or wife, a co-worker, your kids, your weight, your self-defeating thoughts? These are things that people battle every day. Well, try this. Instead of battling your own uh, in your own power, Put on an amazing praise song and start singing. Sing over your situation. Sing over your spouse, your kids, your fear, and your thoughts. Rejoice over your life and lift up an encouraging praise to the Lord. Praise defeats the enemy. He will run, he will run away. When you begin to praise and lift up the name of Jesus, he will run. Can't stand it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Any questions tonight? That was good. Very good. Well, that was good. Yeah, it was a great lesson. I'm going to turn this off for just a second.